Yes. So we try to synthesize the uh, many threads of discussions that occurred during the um, past uh, two days and um, set them up on a set of slides. And actually, when we when we went through this, I think one of the one of the questions we stumbled on early on was the question of what's our ultimate goal. So what where would we want to be in five years from now? And from all that we've heard, we heard two types of um, two types of point of view that I think were laid out in a talk um, yesterday from the um, from the ENCODE PIs um, that uh, um, Joe gave, which was the notion of, are we continuing on a courageous path of cataloging, of measuring a lot of components and interactions and entities across ever increasing numbers? It could be of cell lines and, and conditions and, uh, sorry, cell types and conditions and stimulations and time courses and, and so on. Or is there the wish to reach a level of understanding about the functionality of some of the elements and function being, um, I think, meaning different things for different people, ever, uh, all the way from a very molecular, mechanistic notion of function to a phenotypic function. I, I, I just wanted yeah. to jump in for a second jump and say, I don't know that, that we're saying it's an either or. No, it's not necessarily an either or, just, but these just, are two different dimensions. Yeah, because it was just, you know, layer one was sort of catalog yeah. two. So. I, I agree. They're layer one and layer two, but they are, they are in a, in a, in a, in a world world that's finite, there's more in one or less in the other. These are two different uh, dimensions. Um, and secondarily to this, there was the specific question of how to uh, relate to disease. So even at this level of goal, I don't think we have a strong definition of what that goal is. Various goals were put forth, but they somehow fit on, on, these, on, on maybe a two-dimensional one axis on how, how much have we cataloged, and the other is for any entity that we cataloged, how much do we understand it? <laughs> And, and its interaction with the other entities. The other major notion um, that came up mostly in the uh, uh, kind of evolved during um, the last couple of days was this notion of generalizability. That as Ross has put it out, the space of options is huge. And again, you can one can use analogies that I think are very convenient. If you think of genetic variation in humans, it's ever changing and shifting and expanding because uh, no, not only is it a question of the uh, allele frequencies, but people are simply constantly, people constantly die and people constantly are born and new mutations constantly arise. And so it's, it's, it's an ever shifting entity, yet we can bound it into something that we feel captures a great deal of what is going on and is quite manageable for many practical purposes. In the case of biological systems, because of the way in which they're organized and because of the way in which they evolve and the functions that they perform, we systems are used again and again. And cells are not all distinct from each other in, in radically capricious ways. They're related to each other through different types of shared functionalities and shared lineage and shared entities. So this naive matrix, while huge, could likely be dimensionality reduced in a very aggressive way. The only problem is that we actually don't know how to do this. So the question is, how would we sample the cell types and the cell states and stimulations and perturbations and um, the right type of endophenotype related to sequence in a way that would give us the strongest power to generalize, impute, um, and so on. So we wouldn't have to measure the whole matrix, but we would know most of it, even without measuring it. So within, I think, these two premises, um, there were several types of proposals. In terms of the types of proposed research, they fell into three categories. And again, not every time that there are three or four things, there are zero-sum game and there are one against the other, but they are distinctively different from each other. One is that we could have many cell types with some characterization on them, with the idea that we still really don't know our cell types, and every time we add a cell type, we add a huge amount of information that is incredibly valuable. The second was what seemed to be a strong ambition and aspiration if we could only one day get a piece of sequence and understand the function that it encodes, at least for gene regulation, at least for something like RNA levels or transcription or, or, or one of those um, Indo uh, phenotypes, um, I think this relates to the technical problem of relating regulatory elements to the targets that they control, understanding quantitatively how they exert these targets, and taking a piece of sequence and inferring the expression that is controlled out of it in the particular context. 
most um, of interest. All of these would fall under this umbrella. And the third aspect, again related to the previous two, are the notion that we should be vetting the predicted functions of entities with appropriate perturbations, for example, with genetics, under relevant stimulations, which could be different environments or different differentiation conditions, and not forgetting natural variation that could be a great way of, of getting a lot of bang for the buck. So that's sort of a third uh, bucket of category of the type of research that could be conducted towards the ultimate goal. There is the specific question of how to relate to disease. There are two types of models for that. The fact is to really work with disease samples, either within themselves or compared to healthy samples. And the second is to use the genetics of disease that has already advanced substantially and is constantly advancing in order to prioritize those variants that one would want to assay, for example, for function, and do it in the relevant cell type if that cell type is actually known and available. Um, that immediately, I, I think all of these together open um, the question of what makes a good cell system. So we tried to, um, this did not come up in the discussion, but it should come up, I think, in this discussion of what makes a good system. And while, I, I, you know, one way is to just advocate to a system you already know to be great, but another is to try to abstract away and say what has made particular systems useful. So obviously the issue of accessibility, one would want something that you can actually do something with. There are great cells that are hidden in early developmental transitions and we put a, never put our hands on or not in the near future and so it's not clear that we can work with them. The ability to manipulate them if we need to do manipulations. We need to be able to actually define them because again we need to actually hold them in our hands. If we can stimulate them or differentiate them in ways that we already know then we can build on this knowledge so that our uh, biology is relevant. We ideally would want some that are related to diseases and as I put there add criteria here. I don't think our, we discussed it in the last two days but it's an important item to discuss. There is a question of what are the most informative assays or data. We heard pitches for different types of readouts, for example, on the side of components. We've heard multiple times about RNAs, and there are different types of RNAs. mRNA is just very one particular type. Should it be the one we focus on? A new, uh, renewed uh, focus on proteins, the value of chromatin marks, and so on. I should have added dot, 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 many other there. There is the issue of molecular interactions, transcription factor binding to their targets it raised huge and enthusiasm when for a moment we believed we have 80, 800 validated antibodies and then they were gone. <laughs> but they will come. Um, issues in the 3D organization of the genome. I would say one and two components of molecular interactions are things that are really in the wheelhouse of genomics. Imaging is not, seems to be a great emerging opportunity, including imaging coupled to sequencing-based readouts. That is something that we start seeing appearing in the community. That's, that's a, an area to keep an eye on. Um, and then there's the issue of what functional assays get coupled to what types of readouts. So we had, a, 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 I think, a vigorous discussion around reporter assays. We've heard how yeast folks use readout in, in, in effective ways but there's, there are ways in which yeast and mammals are more similar to each other than we sometimes think, and there are ways in which there are less. So I think readout is actually a, a difficult problem. There is a question of what's the right perturbation to do and how to conduct these perturbations, and we've heard everything from, you know, crispering to uh, doing things in reporters to putting in the endogenous locus or not, all of which for genetics, but also things that are not genetic at all. And then um, I think there's a varying degree of tolerance to error, false negatives and false positives around functional assets. Says. And there are, um, and, and this area of what is acceptable in a primary screen versus a secondary screen versus a vetted result reported in a paper is actually something that maybe not this. The, the, the folks in this room particularly spend a lot of time with, but there are communities that spend a lot of time on this particular question. And then specifically the question of perturbation, people raise the issue of physiological conditions using more stimuli, more differentiation, specifically more time courses. Uh, people um, repeatedly alluded to natural genetic variation, increasing our power to detect uh, important mechanisms, and to engineered variation, mostly through genetics, although at least one person referred to degrons, so it's not always going into the genome to do its thing. There was, especially in the last session, I think the question of organization came really to the front. The current ENCODE, from my perspective, actually, that I, I put in that term, um, 
I would say is a flagship project. There is a predefined notion of its contours and what is there and what's the question that is being asked with it and which cell types and which assays and so on. It's a relatively limited community that is at the core of the activity. There is a good sense of concentration around this goal. That's a flagship and you know, nice papers come out, great resources, wonderful. I think what really has come up in, uh, extensively is how one takes this model and maybe leverages it or extends it or combines it with something that is more community open. And one possibility was for the community to provide samples into the pipeline. The more one would go to specialty cell types, the more difficult it would be for a small community to actually maintain all the expertise needed in those systems, so that's a way. It's also a great way of training and educating and uh, building, I think, humongous goodwill in communities that don't really get yet what ENCODE gives to them. Um, and there's the question of community provided data that has to be vetted. There's a role for the DCC in this context, but there's uh, people are collecting data and they will only collect data more because to a large extent of the effect and success of ENCODE. Um, and then the question of where in this is the role of ENCODE in being the um, either the developer of new technologies, the scaler of technologies that are clearly ready for scaling but won't be scaled by the people who develop them. And I would, um, um, uh, and, and that includes things, everything from the actual technique to data standards and analytics, and also being, again, in the community-minded sense, not just being open to the biologist community, but also being open to the technologist community and shift into new technologies as they arise within the time span of a project. I don't think that was discussed as much, but it's something that we think should. And within this context, oh, something happened to the font, it's very small. Uh, within this context of the community in-reach, outreach interaction, I think there are, uh, there are very uh, subtle things that we would have to consider, how to make ENCODE more accessible, how to leverage on the training possibilities, how to make incoming new technologies um, compatible, how to make it, um, how to make yourself compatible with more sample sparing situations. So you can't always specify conditions that would be very comfortable in a cell line or a big piece of tissue if you want to work with a large community of uh, collaborators or contributors. What is the timeline for improvements? Uh, is it a more or less managed activity? I think there are varying opinions about this. What are the key assays that one would have to keep in order to maintain continuity? Do we continue doing every assay that we've ever started with because it becomes a legacy? We can't let go of it or we switch to uh, new assays and how do we leverage not just small data sets but actually large scale data sets that come from other resources? So I think, yeah, this was it and floor is open for questions and I'll bring back the slides that I just yeah. made go away. Yeah, so we heard over and over again uh, an imperative for developing new technologies, and that's both methods and analytical technologies, and and disseminating those to the community, and of uh, and I'm not sure if if we want to talk about if it's NHGRI's role or, or shared role for making the uh, the data data accessible to many different communities. Now that may be UN's, uh, you know, you got wranglers and brokers that help do that, but I want to make sure that those are recorded as things that we talked about and that need to get done. We probably took them for granted. We, right. we agree. Yeah. Yes. Are we not? So, um, by the way, that's an outstanding <laughs> summary. I, I, I think it clearly appears to be more than the sum of the parts. So, um, I'm just going to come back to this last aspect. I mean, uh, in, in, in introducing uh, the kinds of, I forget whether it was Mike and or Dan, introducing other sort of related projects going out there, it, perhaps it's subsumed under it beyond how this analytical issue that you and, and, and Jeff brought up. Um, you know, there's a question of modeling here that I think should be intrinsic to ENCODE. And, and, uh, we all know we are talking of interactions, but you know it's undefined, and and so one aspect of this has been it should be, you know, to try and model and predict. Um, otherwise, all of these accurate measurements, trying to reduce false positives, trying to make sure that the false negative rate is is low, doesn't quite make any difference. So I, I would think that perhaps it's implicit. 
has not played a huge role in ENCODE so far, and I can see why so far. But I think it should be a very important part going forward. So, so, so do folks pe feel that the goal under Encyclopedia per Joe, uh, or understanding, should be a predictive model? <coughs> Has the time come? I, I think some of that is covered under the judge genomics of gene regulation, right? There's a, that has a modeling component, a data, somewhat data generation related to the modeling. So I don't think it's been ignored. I think it's, to some extent, it's been, it's, it's been, it's its own thing. <laughs> Perhaps it shouldn't be. I, I should respond to that. We've asked him that question. <laughs> so it, it depends on what you mean, and whether it's addressed. I mean, the scientific goal of genomics of gene regulation is to develop models to make, to develop approaches to make predictive gene regulation models from genomic. Um, data. However, the point of gen genomics of gene regulation is not to say go through all of the ENCODE data and analyze it. Rather, it's to develop these techniques and do it in the particular systems the applicants do it. So they could develop methods that could be used on ENCODE data, perhaps by ENCODE people, perhaps outsiders, but they would not. We don't anticipate as part of their projects they would plow through ENCODE data. I would also add that when I just wanted to add that when we asked Mike this in the break, we specifically asked him, is this goal of taking a piece of sequence and predicting something, for example, about expression within the scope of the current GGR project and the, and the plan, he said, that's the aspirational goal, but their expectation when they set up the program and the projects that I imagine are ongoing right now do not take that on as defined like this. And that was definitely something that I heard time and again in this audience, including, you know, figures from reviews that that are in that domain and talking about how the enhancer relates to the sequence and the regulatory code and the regulatory logic and so on. So, so it's a question also to us. Do we think that the time has come for that or is it indeed premature? So, um, right. So I've been, I've been upstairs from Eric Davidson for 27 years and I think you could probably, might be able to redo what he did, fa you know, ENCODE could do that a lot faster now. Um, but it requires, it's, it's a very different, it's focusing on one cell, essentially, right, and, it, and, and its lineage. So I think that's not the way to go. I don't think there's enough data. So I think I would rather see ENCODE, the factory, the production qualities be used for data where you want to compare it across either different samples, right? So every cell type, if there's 400 or 1,000 cell types, then that's where we want a comparison, that you're not going to get that out of individual labs. If you want to beat the crap out of an individual regulatory circuit and model it, that's not what ENCODE's going to be good at. Sorry. No, but I, I, I don't think that's the modeling challenge. I mean, Eric Davidson has a very particular flavor of looking at regulatory networks and how the, how the sea urchin embryos, in, you know, develops. I don't think that's the issue. The issue here is a model and a predictive model in really the statistical and the mathematical, in the statistical sense, that we have to be able to do it. If it's done well, then all of Eric, okay, you know, Davidson model. thing can yeah. be tested. But just as I think I heard a plea, very well made, you know, sort of argument from, from Karen that other kinds of assays will become relevant for ENCODE to become really mature to understand the basic problem. I guess what I'm trying to argue is, uh, perhaps out of my ignorance of g genomics of you know gene regulation, that the time has come, if not you know already, that that kind of modeling should be an intrinsic part. However, you engineer that it enters and goes. Do people agree with that? Because when we brought it up, some level model. Wait, 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 so when we brought it up here with enthusiasm, I would say, the <coughs> conclusion was maybe it's not time. There's a time issue. When is it, when is it the right time to really have a concerted effort on modeling? Is it now, or is that a ball we're going to kick down the road? And we'd really like to know, you know, how, how people feel about it. But it depends what you're talking about modeling. Yeah, these aren't, um, 
you know, we don't have dynamic information. Very exactly. Right. But it's a problem. There is models yeah. correlating to some lines, for example, in the predictions of gene expression. So there is some level model. We're trying to see if you had a transcript effect. So there's some amount of that going on. Oh. I, 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 there's a lot of modeling like Eric David is doing, which is temporal, you know, the temporal dynamic system. That's no, but hidden mark, yeah, hidden Markov models or linear regressions are not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, light uh, or. Now that John did models can go deeper and deeper and more accurate. I mean, even the lab said we, we constantly discover new things, but I think that modeling needs to be an integral part of the input because you can't say I've collected enough data and now I can model. You need to see where your modeling is, how accurate it is to figure out. What ENCODE needs to collect in order to reach the modeling goal? Obviously, the modeling goal is a, a long-term goal. Like, you can't just collect enough data what you think is needed. You actually need to see what can I model now, how accurate my models are now, where am I wrong, and what am I missing to figure out what the best assays to do are in the first place. John, Ted Yeah, I think just as a matter of principle, you should measure what you can measure easily and model the things that are going to be too numerous. <coughs> so for example, we're never going to be able to test all of the variants. All right, so clearly we need a model. That's something for which we need some kind of a model. We're never going to test every single one of the millions of regulatory elements because we can't, we don't have access to cellular context work. But we need a model to learn the rules for how these things are paired up, for yeah, example, but with their target you'll never be able to get And we should not spend any time, at least okay. at the first level, people in the community to do it, uh, trying to model those things that, that we can measure with. easily. Okay? What's the point of modeling? where, let's say, all the DNA hypersensitive sites are getting 50% of the answer when you can just do a quick experiment and get the full answer, you know? And, and so I mean, you can learn some things out of it, but as far as the systematic effort, I think, again, this, just the emphasis should be to partition the measurement from the modeling, the modeling applied to those things that, you know, that really need to scale. Uh, so I, I was just going to say that, um, I, you know, I do think that there's, you know, been some degree of statistical modeling already in ENCODE. I mean, we, I mean, I think one of the big achievements of, say, the 2012 paper was really seeing the degree to which the histone marks and transcription factors could predict gene expression. And it was really quite impressive, I think, to see that. And I mean, it wasn't at all obvious until you actually saw all that data come together and to see those predictions that you would get that accuracy. And, and I think, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the things with collecting very large data sets is it's not, you sometimes get very powerful stati you know, statistics from them and sometimes you don't know what you're going to exactly get. And so I do think that there's been some of that. And I, I don't know if that should be an aim of ENCODE, but I do think that it's useful when you have these very big data sets to see how they interrelate and fit together. And, and it gives you much better confidence that you actually understand the data set when you can kind of sort of see how it all puts together. I mean, and I also want to point out that, the, you know, <laughs> one person's model is another person's imputation. I mean, what we're hearing about in relation to, for, for instance, to these, the transcriptome imputation from nanostates, I mean, that's another type of modeling. I mean, all these are different types of types of things. That, that takes the question of what are we actually modeling in the first imputation? Yeah, so I, I mean, just going back to some one of the first slides, I mean, I, I very much hope that this is a, this is a encyclopedia, right? That's the goal and not a catalog, right? And, and to some extent that, you know, understandable function. I mean, one of the, I mean, just to answer your, your comment, John, um, I mean, I see what you're saying, but at the same time, I mean, one of the reasons you model is to show that you can understand something, right? You can dissect it down to a model, which, which in turn means that you understand the underlying phenomena at some greater level than just describing it, right? Um, so I, I, I appreciate the, the power, I, I, sorry. I appreciate the power and the value of models, okay? But the question is, this is something, is this something that is applied at a consortium level, or is this something that is applied at a community level? when, quite honestly, it's more of a crowdsourced type of, uh, uh, of answer, ultimately. Because I think that's where, you know, I think our goal should be to seed the models in, in some way. And there are some places where models have to be coupled to high throughput biology, where, you know, where it makes sense at a consortium level. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not discounting the goal, I'm just saying whether that's something that needs to be conducted. But they're also like kind of coming back to Donna's point. I mean, there are places where the the choice of experiments is directed by what will most inform the model, right? And and 
and I think that should be an important goal here. But. I think with modeling the contours on, there is an ambition we need to understand the wrong possibility. The uh, models are not built as one off, they need to be built iteratively, so you can't completely decouple them. And we need to actually understand what we are modeling, what it is that we're trying to do. We, we have a large ground to cover, so we're going to move out of models and into other aspects. <coughs> Carol will take those. So we wanted to get a little bit more feedback on this community in reach. The one that we can't read. I'll make it big just one second. Uh, because many, many of you in your presentations brought up uh, kind of alternative models uh, for going forward. <coughs> with new initiatives, and we wanted to make sure that this slide really captured It's a little bit more keep the slide with we'll <laughs> so. so does this capture the flavor of those of you who did address this in your presentations? Is this, in the discussion, does this capture? We heard about bringing in data from the community, making data readily available to the community in ways that reach really broadly, and the notion of bringing in samples from the There are a lot of little details associated with it that would make a big difference for us. So how can we go about making this transparent um, to the investigators who are doing some of these things in their own lab? I think in code is, you know, obviously everyone has heard of or knows in code, but to some extent there's, I think, a a, a moat in some regards in terms of how to cross, you know, where's the bridge? Who's going to build the bridge? That has to come from ENCODE, I would think, initially, to build the infrastructure for these in-reach types of projects, and, and how can we begin to do that? I guess you want to I mean, just, just to say, I keep coming back to this, I, I mean, ENCODE behaves exemplary or very well in the way that it's coordinated its metadata standards. And this means that other people who use those standards, and you're encouraged to use those standards when you submit through Array Express, sometimes when you submit through GEO, um, are compatible, the metadata is compatible with the same standards. So there isn't some kind of them and us kind of uh, split of the standards happening worldwide. It's the other way around. Everything's been coordinated. What I think is harder to know is, is having someone that tries to pull data together and consistently analyze it um, from both small and bigger labs. And I think that what I think is a very good idea that's been suggested is more this business of uh, the sample kind of, uh, you know, asking for cell lines and samples coming in. Whereas my experience over time is that when you try and coordinate data sets that haven't upfront been thought through as being coordinated, it's much harder to derive good aggregate information out of that. And that's been the experience sort of many times. It's not that it's impossible to do that, but it's just much, much harder. And and I, the thing that out of the, the last day that, that felt right to me was the idea of having, um, as well as standards, but really having a, a community input for the, for the samples. I, I don't think my important, but, um, yeah. you know, what are you doing now with one point that it's not just cells, it could be cells and one anxiety we had would be specialized assays or phenotypes for that community, which could be very difficult for the end code investigators to bring up available. And that may be a parameter that needs to be discussed at the time projects are accepted or not. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the reality is there's going to be a lot. Is it working? Uh, no, let's try. Just project. The reality is a lot of these experiments are going to go on the outside, and I think it would be a shame not to collect them. And we do bring that to the cost of the chart, right? Uh, but I still think there's value to do that. But I do like the idea, as I said already, about having some infrastructure laid aside to be able to take samples. Because it will come out better, it will come out more uniform. And 
know, we all remember the microarray days, right, where things clustered by lab, not by sample. Mm -hmm. I have the fact that you're getting event code, too, and the fact that the chip days is exactly that. And we want to avoid that if we can, so that is the value. So I would endorse that as sort of first, but I do think it's not that good. Dana, then Mike. Yeah, so Mike said a lot of what I wanted to say, but I just wanted to stress one thing, that it's, it's a big effort right now. It's probably not worth it for the data that's out there, but the, the bang for your fleet for our bucket we get if we figure out how to integrate everything that's collected out there, and maybe not everything, but everything that matches the data standard. So the ENCODE could say, okay, if you collect your data in this specs this way with this protocol, we can integrate it, invoke the effort to figure out what those specs are, to, and then do some type of pipeline for vetting, then over time, I think the community will collect the and crowdsourcing far more than the end code could ever collect on its own, and there would be value given the size of the space. I completely agree. I also want to point out that uh, integrate is different, right? There's uh, there's methods that actually are quite robust to differences in signal to noise ratios and data patterns, and can handle integrating all these things. Whereas for other methods, like you know, if you're trying to figure out differential binding, say you really do need the data to be as carefully controlled as possible. So we have, you know, so it's going to be non-trivial how we put this data in and how we develop these pipelines, and at which point is it being shown to the end user and how. But I think that we just, we can't ignore all this data that's been out there. I don't know if it's worth investing millions of dollars to curate what's already out there, but making sure that new data goes in would be important. Mike So with respect to these two different models of either taking in community samples and processing them, we're taking in community data, and we need to think of it, I would say, as the trade-offs associated with both. Obviously, the data that's already generated, you know, that's there. And so maybe there, there's a cost savings in that data already exists. On the other hand, with respect to bringing in data, there are data collection biases, and especially we hear this with RNA, where it seems it's very different, one lab to the next, and there's a lot of difficulties integrating them. And we're hearing this with GTEx and within ENCODE and some other projects. So that would suggest that if one had a choice, you might be better off taking the sample rather than the data. But you know, when it's done already, it's done. More on this, um, more on this aspect. Could we continue to turn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, sir. You're right, because of them. Um, so I think, um, on organization and on the overall goal, we got uh, we got a pretty uh, decent uh, decent view. We heard a little bit about modeling. I would love to hear more from people about their notion of what they would want to see functionally happen. That's one of the strongest things we heard, I think, from the ENCODE PIs and also from the general community that people would want to know what the elements are doing. Yet, what that exactly means is still, at least in my brain, a little fuzzy in terms of trying to reflect what people are thinking about this. Obviously, I have my own ideas. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. I think that's a, that's a big one because it, it defines a lot of what a project actually looks like, eventually. Mike, then Dana, then whomever. Well, what I don't see up there, I like everything up there, but what I don't Add. see up there, or maybe it's inferred but not explicit, is I would like to see some reference lines that really do the third item where you do do a dynamic backwards. It integrates a lot of the discussion I've seen already over the last few days. Where you would do you know, some sort of developmental time course or stimulus, what have you. Uh, I don't think it has to be defined by this group, probably shouldn't be defined by this group necessarily. But it should be areas of most importance, that's where the controversy comes in. But you would actually take that and you would do a deep dive where you generate incredible data sets that would be a reference. It can be matched up against variation. Uh, it can be matched up against all sorts of things. And you would have all these other perturbations you listed at the top, uh, which is the genetics. So I guess that's what I'd like to see. Maybe a half a dozen of these reference systems, if you will. So, so is that a like a GGR on steroids? <laughs> yeah, basically, it would be complementary. Okay. Oh, I'm actually wondering would that match up more with the Lynx project? 
Yeah, I. It, it kind of cross. It could. It should match up. It's kind of the cross between them, maybe. Well, it should match, for example, with G text. You have to figure out the variation side how to bring that sort of information. You could choose. You might choose. I'll just say cardiomyocytes. Right. Right. Choose differentiate the cell, then you want to make sure the G text will get a whole bunch of people, or maybe it's marriage with G text. They map variation out in a whole bunch of different people for you to do cardiomyocytes differentiation, for example. And the same would be true for links and things like this. And this is how you would leverage, I think, across the different projects to maximize information at a much higher level than we're doing now. So you can really gain some new dimensions. I, I, I only modified the word lines into cell types so that people yeah, won't. Yeah, and in fact, tissue as well. Yeah. Dana and then Joe. So first Dana, then Joe. So I'm going to keep it very vague, but I want to add a thinking point. So I think a lot of the reason that uh, ENCODE is, 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 is valuable is because <laughs> we are doing it in high throughput and large scale and, and genome-wide. And I think that many of the, and one of the problems with perturbations that we're encountering is that our perturbations are currently very limited one by one or not quite one by one, but not not <coughs> scale. So I think that not being a technologist myself, one of the questions should be, given that there's so many interesting things we could possibly do, which ones can we scale up large scale rather effectively? And that should be one guiding principle because a large scale genome wide or, or high throughput functional assay <coughs> is more, maybe more valuable than the one that I would rather have, but I get one at a time. And um, that's the technologist. We had, so Joe and Lori, but somebody else had their... Doesn't work. Uh, I just want to echo what Mike said. Uh, that, that having cell systems solves many of the problems that we have. One is tissue accessibility. So you could have a system, cardiomyocytes or otherwise, you could develop assays that match the context. So the challenge is being able to have it, you know, rather than just cancer cell lines, which have been valuable, to have assays that you say come from predictions about whether or not uh, particular enhancers are expressed in at a certain time during cardiomyocyte development. You can then capture all the epigenetic information and assay it in the right context with a high throughput assay of your whatever flavor you would like to, to have. So I think that there's a practical reality as well is a lot of the tissues that you'd like to do assays and aren't going to be single cell long transform lines. So you're going to need to do some kind of differentiation protocol. So I think that also capturing the genetic variation. So if you choose those cell types correctly, think about the genetic variation. Populations that are being studied, for example, where you have consented lines, IPS lines, you could then link other projects by definition of the fact that it's the same consented individuals that are providing the fibroblasts that you then put into a differentiation protocol. So I think the, the idea of having these cell systems proposed by either in laboratories that are expert in that or, uh, you know, collaborators, et cetera, that are directly part of the project would, would solve a lot of problems and bring a lot of the projects together if the coordination could happen before the project started, which has been a challenge for in the past for a lot of the, the, the uh, NHGRI-funded projects. But now we have an opportunity to bring some of them together through picking cell systems that integrate these kinds of uh, the, uh, different um, Projects. So I'm not going to add anything much more sensitive than that, but that was exactly the point of my talk uh, last night, where if you start with a model where you can um, take it from a single cell to a differentiation event to a disease model. I think, for example, if we can pick a few of these kinds of cell systems, we're going to be able to extrapolate that to very generalizable principles, and um, especially those that you can actually test things in model organisms, I think will also be key. And so, you know, I like that we're talking about cardiomyocytes. 
Um, I think I'll write a grant on that. No. Um, but I think that this is what we have to think about. What's the right cell system that will allow us to actually move through all of these questions in a single system from normal variation, normal development to a disease model, to a model organism? So while well, I'm a real advocate of doing time courses and looking at dynamics, uh, one thing we might want to keep in mind as a word of caution is uh, what are you going to get out of this? You're going to get a time course of histone marks, RNA, um, maybe other factors, but maybe the reality of it is everything will be demarcated by activation and repression as you can define by, for example, RNA. So um, if you have genes that are activated, you're going to see change in histone marks. Okay, so you're going to see the same thing all over again, but in the same sort of, but now in a, a time series. And I'm not sure you're going to gain anything uh, that you already don't know about activation that you couldn't see from RNA. No, yeah. but, but all genes are not regulated in the same way. <clears throat> and so you're going to learn about differences in how genes are regulated. For example, you do school genes may be regulated very differently than another set of and you can look at RNA levels, but you're going to see very different chromatin associations. But that also may lead you to more of the biochemical questions. What are the complexes that are highlighting these changes in chromatin conformation that could not be read out at the RNA level? So I do think that you would learn a significant amount by looking at these things in the data sets. And I, and, and I think, you know, we looked at the salt response in yeast, which is pretty simple. Just, uh, we looked at the salt response system in yeast and thought we had the major factors, we knocked them out and they would go away, and the whole thing would be explainable. And almost none of it was explainable. It was a disaster. We knew so much less than we thought we knew. I think that'll happen in these systems, and that's why you want to collect the data and do it, so you can really understand them at the level we want to. You know, humans should be more complex, so I think the challenge will be bigger. Mike Basin. I think we were hearing from Aravinda yesterday about cell type specific enhancers. And this is something that we would get beyond just simple gene regulation, knowing where the variation is in those regulatory elements, what's causal. I think that would be an extra thing that we would get out of that. So let me pause for a moment and ask if you looked at Aviv's very nice slides, are there high level topics that are not represented that should be? Did, did, we, did the group that met and threw grapes at each other up here during lunch, did we miss something that should have been on the, you know, in this list of topics that emerged from this meeting? And don't use this to bring up new topics now, but are there, are there generalities that came through the meeting that we missed? I think is maybe the... Can you flip through the high level? Or you just flip through the slides? Yeah, I'll, I can go through them very quickly. Because, you know, one, one thing to add to it, it's already been mentioned, is, you know, we are all moving into an era where, uh, you know, samples that are used and, and you know, cells from sample individuals that are used, you know, they need to be appropriately consented, and we don't go back to this issue of we can't now do it, you know, going yes. back. It's a very important part. This may be old news to the genome community, but if we are to encourage others to add data, this is a very, very important thing to, to get across. I added it, like. Dana? So this actually relates to this slide, even though it's not a good point, but I actually think that in, um, in relation to disease, the ENCODE should very much be uh, understanding the healthy um, tissue and how variations in, in the elements cause disease. So I, I actually think that ENCODE should mostly stick to assaying and understanding healthy tissue and then how what goes wrong in disease. But you need the healthy as a baseline to understand disease. This is a point uh, in assays on which I think there was a lot of discussion. We, it's not an exhaustive slide. Yeah, discussion, but, but already the font was very small. So. Yeah. And I think for our meeting, this doesn't need to be exhaustive. Yeah. No, I just wanted to point that out. And then there's the issue of perturbation, the different organizational models that I think we discussed, and the further details on the community. That's it. So, uh, Aviv, one thing that we heard a couple of times, I think that leads to this, or talks 
about this organizational strategy is whether or not everything needs to be done by these like large consortia. So this seems to focus a lot on like how the community interfaces with ENCODE. But I guess what I'm wondering is how does ENCODE interface with ENCODE? Um, and so whether or not you have one big consortia or you have more loose ties among people where, you know, you agree on a cell line and then people can kind of come, what, what was the analogy, instead of quarterly reports, maybe annual reports and maybe a less top-down managed structure, whether or not there's some room for that, especially in the, the avenues that were going to be more like technique driven or, you know, technique development, and to, to give space for things that we don't know anything about today when we're sitting here to still funnel into the pipeline. And so I guess one thing that I don't see here is this idea of, you know, how will the consortia be, themselves be organized? And, and is, could there be a move from everything being kind of very top down to more openness um, and flexibility in the, the structure of the projects? I'll make just one comment. I think this is something an EGRI uh, might be way better equipped than I am to, to comment. I actually don't even exactly know how it's run today. So, But the one tidbit that is actually on the slide after this one, the one with a very small font, is that there is this notion of maybe porousness to new technologies allowing more flexible switching as they come up. And that is an organizational principle that might be different than the way things have been done before. So if, you know, Will wakes up in the morning and comes up with some crazy new additional essay and we all get really excited, you're not locked in exactly. by a contract. Right. So that's I, the only tidbit I would add. I think Elise would have much so I just want to comment on the current, current structure, which is um, fairly top down, but there are investigator initiated uh, groups, the technology development are basically R01 projects. Um, we also are an open consortium, so we have other groups that apply for membership to the consortium as long as they agree to abide by the data release policy and to really be actively involved. So there are there is the opportunity to bring new groups in. We do have a little bit of flexibility within the production groups to bring in new technologies. A couple of people are doing a taxi, for example. Um, and of course, we only, we do need to modify milestones to allow for that. But I think we're not completely what we started in year one has to be the same as year four. But we don't have a lot of flexibility. And so I think this model of I can imagine there being, you know, sort of a mixed model where we do have some flexibility and, and you know, on ramps. But some of the other things that I'm hearing about, like bringing in samples from the community or um, samples or data, I mean, I think are going to require a lot more management than we actually currently have. Totally. I, I was more thinking of uh, easier transitions between, let's say, the R01s that are for technique development, and mm -hmm. then let's say you sponsor a really, really productive R01, they come up with a great technique. It, it, could it be a very easy pipeline to go from that into one of the consortia mm -hmm. and immediately make that something that and it, what is one of the sort of ENCODE vetted assays? I, mean, I, th I think it's hard to get new money in, in the middle years. I think that's probably one of the limited factors. I don't know if any of the data producers want to comment on sort of the ability to bring in new assays. Essays. Well, uh, yeah, we feel locked in somewhat, but there is some room. I think, you know, my own expectation, it's interesting when ENCODE 2 came, we were right at that switching between chips and sequencing. And so we did keep an eye, and that one was a dramatic change. That happened like that. So that was adopted quickly, I would say. Other things maybe not so fast. I assumed we'd all be switching to EXO, chip EXO, quite frankly, and then and that has to happen because it's been tougher. So I think it is getting vetted and it does happen. It might be a little bit like an oil tanker where it happens kind of slowly, but uh, it does happen. Can John say something about this too? Um, yeah, I think that the history of the project has been one where there has been continuous uh, development of new assays and absorption and implementation in parallel with 
the regular production assays and when it made sense to shift over, I mean, Mike indicated that, you know, the dramatic shift from sort of microarrays to sequencing that, that happened very quickly. Um, and then even then, the, the format of the assays, I mean, we have changed the format of the DNAs one assay several times. It's undergoing another change, you know, now. And I think there's, there is continuous implementation of that. And I think, I mean, for, as from a speaking from the data producer's point of view, I don't think I have ever felt, and I'm sure Mike would say the same way, constrained at all by NHGRI. It, as long as we are meeting, moving forward with our production milestones, that that you know, to try to to innovate as much as possible, and I think that's that's part of the that's part of the picture because ultimately those have always re, re, you know resulted in reduced costs and and uh, and higher throughput. But I think that's within the specific goals and the specific general data types. It's not really talking about new technologies or new or new groups. Mm -hmm. well, one example would be Chia Pet, which we're trying to integrate now, so we do have to justify this at least what's that going to do to the other production, which is reasonable. So it, that, and we also have to show it's really, really working too, right? So, um, well, just that. So, so there's a trade-off here that hasn't been addressed. And that is, you know, the, switching to the most current uh, different technology project. can get better data, and that's a, that's usually a good thing. But what happens if somebody like Adam wants to look through the matrix and see what's there, and partway through the matrix, this technology has changed, that experiment's no longer being done. Suppose somebody's interested in some disease, and says these are two important cell types, and for one, assays A, B, and C were done. For the other, assays X, Y, and Z are done. But they need to directly compare them. And so we need to consider the continuity of data, which is important in one way, and generating the, the best data that can be done today as is, is an issue also. <laughs> I was in the bad seat. Um, I. I still, I, I know I keep coming back to this. I, um, I, wanna, I want to uh, make sure that like every transcription factor deserves its day in the sun. And um, I would, I, the only fear I have about all of these other aspects is that, is that it, it means that there's less emphasis on, on going out across all those transcription factors. And maybe, I think it will be, I think we will regret not having a comprehensive view of every transcription factor in the human genome in one cell type somewhere. Um, part, of, part of three, the community? No, when you go back to that other side. No, no, it's not in this slide, simply. But it's part of, it was somewhere. Yeah. Because that's actually where some of those factors are going to be relevant in that space. This this vet function with perturbations? Well, right. so it's why we build a reference as a deep dive of all the TFs in there. Ah, uh, okay. All right. If that if that's right. In my personal encoding, it was fine with the regulatory code. Okay. Um, it's just that the regulatory elements. I that. In fact, no, you thought of number two. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I I just feel that I, I, there's no there's there's no way around it. That so, there's some really hard miles to go through. Whether that means, you know, really pushing antibodies. Whether that's making new technologies. There's something hard about that task, and uh, and I, I think it, I think we will regret not doing it if we don't go through every transcription factor. And and also in molecular interaction. It's one to one, so we have my life. Yeah. Like, what do you mean by going really through a... every time? This one? You're, you're obviously thinking of something more than simply finding out and just doing chip seek. I uh, know. That's that's all. I well, I would I, I would be extremely happy. Chip seek on every transcription factor, and and we're two hundred in out of sixteen hundred. Yeah. yeah. And, and I would add to that the fact. I would add to that the fact that if you have done it, this particular case, the value would be less in the data than in the research reagent. So if you end up with antibodies that yeah. are vetted, it means you can apply it in many other contexts. Exactly. So on the other hand, yeah. oh, if you, it's all tagging, then it's a whole different story. Yeah. How do you standardize that? So antibodies, there's a, you know, a lot of discussion over the standardization of antibodies. Right. Who, who chooses the right name? How do you make that choice? 
Great Still, point. I think at the end of the day, if you're going to really try to fundamentally understand or compare transcription factors one to another, um, I think we have to start talking about antibody independent types of technologies that can then oh, wow. binding. I mean, I think that would be great, uh, but I, I would be up for just, if, even if one had antibodies with all of its, you know, complexions about epitopes and blah, 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 blah and stuff like that, I mean, I mean, it, they work now for 200. One gets good information out of that. Yeah, I think, I just want to add, I think to solve that problem, for sure, tagging is a strategy, and it's impossible to tag every single cell type, but you can make it in, for example, mice, and then you basically get a infinite number of production of any pr primary cells. And uh, also, for any higher priority uh, genetic manipulation on the test, if you make any model, you have an in vivo model, also you can cross them, it's different from the cells, you can really study the combinatory uh, effect. So we, we talk a lot about, you know, choose different system, but I don't think there's any conclusion of how much efforts would put in real model, one model, and what's going on with this mouse encode? Um, yeah. Just want to just want to mention the no, 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 no. wait. Can we have? Oh yeah. Oh, just, so I I just wanted to comment on the the what kind of information you're thinking of getting out of the transcription factor binding site list. So if you do it in a particular cell type, you'll get a particular series of binding sites. And then if you perturb the cell, you know, you'll get a slightly different set of binding sites. And then the same transcription factor in a different cell type will bind to something else. So the question is, what is the goal of that initial cataloging? Are you trying to find what the motifs that the transcription factor binds to are? Or, you know, what exactly are you trying to get out of it? I mean, I can respond to that. Um, yeah, so I think I think finding those motifs and that initial thing, there are there are obviously all the flaws that you mentioned, um, but just as we found it incredibly useful to know all the binding sites of the current two hundred transcription factors, uh, wouldn't it? I mean, it's kind of one of those things. Kind of obviously, if we if somebody we would not refuse <laughs> getting getting all sixteen hundred. In, in equal detail, and I'm sure there'll be bits of biology that drop out, but it wouldn't be the full answer. I mean, let me just stress, I mean, this it's not like having that somehow magically allows you to understand every cell type or, or, or what have you. That, that, that It's a long way off. It's just a very important component. And interestingly enough, it, it's a countable component that we know whether we've got to the end of that list or not for some definition of the list, but that's, that's fine. Yeah. 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 I just want to comment. It seems like this particular goal is something where there are a couple of other groups in the community that are cranking on this, like Tim Hughes and UC Typo. I mean, they're just tagging factors, chipping them, getting the motifs, and they are doing them in the hundreds, right? For the zinc fingers. Yeah, okay. But what, I, what I'm getting at is that there's a limited number of players here. It's totally synergistic with, with ENCODE. We already know who they are. It seems like this is the kind of thing to bring the, everybody together and just, you know, and just do it. Yeah. Just to reemphasize the need for the TFs and them providing more than just motif information, because we have, yes, TF binding profiles, but we also have chromatin loops, we also have expression, we can make inferences as to what are the functions of some of these TFs. And so, for instance, for chromatin loops, now we know that ZNF143 is a chromatin looping factor because we've been able to use the chip seek data from that factor that was chipped for probably just because an, an antibody was good against it. And now we know that it's a chromatin looping factor. We wouldn't have known otherwise. And I'm sure that from the list of remaining TFs, we'll find additional function that are yet to be discovered, so. So I guess, I mean, what about model organisms in general? Like, where, where does, where do modern code and mouse encode kind of fit into people's thinking about the future of this? So, so was that on, was that on the slides? I, if it was, I missed it, but. 
again, I would let, I think NHGRI carry the brunt of the answer on this, on where do mod modern code and the other model organism on code sit in this. But I would say that I think there is a component of model organism that is really that model organism's encode. And there's a component of model organism which is use the model organism as a piece of this encode. And I think that's quite different. So when Laurie goes into a fish and looks at a heart phenotype, if that's what you do, actually, yes, you do. Or when um, you engineer the right mouse model to get the right cell type out of it for John to, to look at some T cell phenotype or for Angela to look at exhaustive T cell, that's a different type of application. That's driven by the human side, not by the, the model organism side. Not to say that the model encode is not important, but I don't think it's exactly the same thing. Um, my word. So, so I guess it depends on what we mean by mod and code and mouse and code, right? So, I, I would say I think we're still committed to um, the mouse and and learning as much as we can about about the genome. Whether you know, with it's, I, it kind of depends on what the next phase is going to look like in terms of continued data generation. But I do think that. Um, it's unlikely for us to bring in new model organisms and do a whole new complete cataloging of those, but I think it does make sense to bring them in when the biology um, dictates. Even is it from a point of view of data generation, mouse is still part of this? Well, cur currently it is. Um, I, we want that's what we want. We want to hear from the we want to hear from the community about about that, including this discussion. Right? Yes, absolutely. So, folks. Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, Jeff? Oh. We, we have a certified mouse person. <laughs> no, I think this is very exciting. I think there are a lot, probably not in the immediate future, but there's so many um, such well characterized knockout mice, for example all on a uniform genetic background, and it was alluded to just a few minutes ago. So you can take these at any developmental stage. You can cross them to anything you want if you happen to want to. But you can, I could think of uh, zillion experiments to do using this data, if it, using data that was generated uh, from these animals. So you can look at animals and you know, because of the characterization with the phenotyping consortium that's going on, you're going to say, even though it's not a major phenotype, you know the kidney's affected. <clears throat> you know the heart is affected, and, and so on. So it provides guidance on what cell type data that you would use from the human to design your experiments in the mouse. And in addition to this, and people, I'm not a computational person, but collaborators certainly use the uh, data that's available in ENCODE as it is to direct interpretation of mouse experiments. Uh, for example, we have a H. Huntington's project and looking at very early changes in gene expression in mouse models for, uh, with repeat expansion in Huntington's. And you get changes well before there are any changes in disease. But when you look and compare with the um, differentially expressed genes in humans, there's considerable overlap. And with the transcription regulatory networks, it's the same sets, or an overlapping set, rather, of transcription factors. So I think having the ability to manipulate the mouse of resource of extremely well-characterized uh, targeted mutations makes this, having the data specific to mouse as a framework, as people have called it, uh, framework, to layer on to the interpretation is going to be immense, just because you can manipulate these animals. How, how much genomics is done on COMP, <coughs> inside COMP, if at all? Oh, there it's just, it's just simply knockouts. So people and don't do, say, any genomic sampling out of so that? No, that's and it's the, the same, uh, it's the same question yeah, as what tissue, for example, you would genomics. love to have differential expression, but what tissue, what cells, it's just would, it would magnify into the millions and millions of... So, so can I just... Uh, oh, the phenotyping is um, histological, developmental, you know when lethality would be. You have behavioral phenotyping, 
you have metabolomics, not met really metabolomics, but blood chemistry. Um, so it's a basic profile. And of course, behavior and morphology. And it's pretty crude, but it's in depth. And it's, it's um, <clears throat> for as complicated as a mouse is and as complicated as animal husbandry is, it's very well standardized. So yes, there's like the expression. Can you just during a, during embryogenesis? So, but, so for can example, can I just add? Sorry, can I just add that you know the right now with the CRISPR, it's uh, much much more cheaper. You can usually make a, yes a tagged mouse with a few thousand dollars, maybe two thousand dollars, and then you can also uh, there literally one lab make hundreds of lines of long non collinear deletion mice in half a year. Yes, and this is definitely something uh, on a scale of doable. And that's that. That's going to and far outpace the characterization, which is much harder. Right. Exactly. The, the the phenotyping is all in place, and now Comp are also switching to CRISPR to do yes, the, they are the leftover. Yeah. That suggests, for example, that if hypothetically there's a transcription factor focused activity, then one could take all the comp mice that are transcription factor knockouts, and based on their phenotypes, define a set of of tissues of interest, or just go standardly, say, into spleen or into something simple like that, which is, yeah, you know, the equivalent of PBMCs idea. for the mouse. Yeah. That, that would be extra, but I'm saying the comp piece that just knocks them out exists without any extra work. No new lines have been phenotypes. Phenotypes. Doing the extra tagged ones, a layer on top. So just, but just to remind you, I mean, I think though, so I am, let me just step back out and then I'm going to step back in. Um, I really think there's a huge number of opportunities still around understanding how, how chromatin interacts with gene expression in a more idealized way from all sorts of models. And, and I, you know, I put fly and worm right in there as well as, as, well as mice. Uh, for that that kind of conceptual classification, just to remind you of the work both of Mouse and Code that was published, and of Duncan Odom and Paul Flechek, is that when you chip the same transcription factor in multiple mammalian species, you see a very very high amount of movement of the chip seek peaks between mammals, and that's quite separate to protein coding genes. So, whatever one would be when you're building that uh, a kind of catalog in mouse, you've really got to be cognizant of the fact that it's not going to be a, a, a simple one-to-one -one mapping of those sites. So I think, th on the other hand, the ability to tag an organism, have every tissue possible come from that, and it's a mammal, and although that diversity is there, it's very clear that a lot of the cellular programs are very, very homologous, comparable between human and mouse does give you, and you could use that divergence to your advantage. I, all I'm saying here is that I think there's, there's quite a lot of pros and cons on both sides uh, for this. And, um, and I think there will, the, it's going to be one of those annoying things where neither, neither extreme is correct. I would add that at the level of the individual site, the instance, there's not going to be great conservation. But in the level of the physiological function of a factor in a response, that seems to be much more conserved. They, they switch their, they partly switch their targets, they definitely switch the places in the genome where they control their targets. So there's stuff you can get out of it that would be very valuable and stuff that, la that a lot less. And one would have to tweak in the right way. But it's a, it's a good uh, thought experiment to go through in terms of what, where, would, where would the interface lie? One simple point, although I, I think it's important if one does set up on the systems that you do this on and does go the IPS route, it would be advantageous to use lines where there's actually a lot of phenotyping behind the people from which the lines were generated and the data is all open. So the point is there's getting to be a lot of lines from very well phenotyped people and that would be a great way to start. Good comments. They're openly consented too, so. Are there, are there any other comments uh, for this general discussion? Okay. Not, I think we're going to um, move into a um, higher level, yet another higher level uh, of this discussion. And 
before you hear from NHGRI, um, we've asked, uh, we've, I guess, four council members here um, if they want to make any comments about their thoughts in terms of priorities um, within what we've heard today and within NHGRI. And I'm going to call on Eric Borwinkle first, who I think has to leave soon. Sure. And okay. So I have a, several comments. First, I think it's important to realize, you know, maybe for everyone, you know, what does council do is, um, won't surprise you, particularly in genomics, there's more great ideas than there's dollars. And so really what we do is help the institute grapple with that fundamental reality. And as I see it, there's really only four options. You either cut the budget of the items to fit within a fixed um, budget. Then you argue well, how far can you cut before the science really is damaged so much there's no need to do it in the first place. The other is to find partners from other institutes. Um, and, and I think that's particularly important with the discussion of the community engagement. That may be an avenue for NHGRI to find partners to help fund ENCODE, which is my understanding that hasn't happened before. Probably the most painful choice is to kick the can down the road. I guess um, NIH institutes have learned a lesson from Congress is just, just keep kicking the problems down the road and fund it in the next fiscal year, or the next fiscal cycle. Ultimately and painfully, the other choice is not to do it. Um, I think the other then is, you know, how does council prioritize things? Um, this is my opinion is basically the, how does it fit in the medium term vision? Um, is, council seems to really love the generation of resources, um, community resources, which I think is a, a great advantage for ENCODE. Um, and again, the, if there's partners and there's cost sharing, that's another um, obvious um, advantage. I think the most important thing I see for the Institute to grapple with, along I hope with the investigators and, and others in the community, is to fill out Aviv's first slide. What, what is the clear vision, mission, goal of the next cycle of ENCODE? In, in, ten, you know, in 10 seconds, what is it? And if it takes longer than 10 or 15 seconds, you probably haven't honed it yet. If you've got to give a half an hour speech to, to convince the audience, it's not going to work. I think an added challenge that I realize in helping um, pull together this meeting is we need to clearly answer the question, what is unique, what's the unique opportunity for ENCODE going forward that's not already being covered in GTEx and links and GGR, et cetera. And, and once again, that's be very clear. How, how, what is new and what's different for ENCODE? And, and then I think, but, but on the other hand, you don't want to make it so different that there are no synergies. So I think the group, um, again, it, with community engagement, we need to identify a path by which ENCODE clearly has its own clear mis mission, but yet there are synergies with either other institutes or synergies with um, similar projects. I can't emphasize enough in my opinion, this is totally my opinion, I, you know, having as this clear you know, sort of resource generation goal and the idea that the next phase of ENCODE will have a lot more community engagement, um, I, I think will, will resonate quite positively. Um, that's, so that's my sort of two cents about, you know, as a council member, what I would be looking for and trying to predict um, the discussion around the table. I have to say predicting council's discussions are probably a lot like predicting enhancer activity. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll echo what what Eric said, and I'll also say that one of the things that's especially emerged, I think, from this discussion is um, how the vision that we've talked about, the projects that we talked about, how that resonates relative to NHGRI's traditional role and mission in genome biology. I mean, a lot of the things that were talked about here are these concepts of endophenotypes with protein levels and proteomics and shotgun proteomics. That is really sort of traditionally outside of the kinds of work 
that NHGRI has done in the past. And I think that, that this is probably going to be one of the discussions that we will have, we always have at council, uh, the two times I've been there, about how these projects sort of fit in, how NHGRI is uniquely positioned um, to contribute to the community. And I think that's in one way why resource projects fare very well in NHGRI, because that very, for the cost, the impact is quite high and has been quite high. But once you start rolling out from these data generation into trying to use them to understand biology, now you've got these gray areas where new technologies that aren't necessarily genomics technologies and questions that may be more disease focused than uh, NHR traditionally has focused on sort of come to the foreground. And I think that's, that's going to be a balance that we're going to have to discuss uh, going forward. So, and Joe, I don't... I don't have a huge amount to add to this um, discussion. I think um, the points that were raised by Eric were cogent and right on, right on the mark. Um, you know, I think that this, the, 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 um, the, the challenge is to weigh, you know, the, the basic, the, the basic for discovery aspect, right? So the basic biology, NHGRI Council is committed to having um, ge genome biology be up front. And this is, this is one of the projects that, that I think meets that criteria with providing a lot of basic information about the genome. And, and if, if other aspects can be linked to the, to the sort of downstream medical applications by the, the nature of the, the, in the next phase of having, you know, for example, what Mike mentioned or others, samples that can bridge that gap um, just by their very nature of the genetic variation that exists, I think you can even merge the council. <laughs> on uh, on this issue, so I think uh, that that's 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 that would be a, a way of of combining both the basic and the more medical aspects of of the project. So I think that that's that's an area that is uh, I think that that area would be terrific for uh, uh, for for the next phase. So I'm not even sure where to start here. Um, so I, I echo, I think, all the other co council members made good, really on-target comments. So, um, so I mean, it's clear this has been an extremely successful project, right? And some of the virtues that I think have come up over and over are things like the high quality of the data, the ability to access it unfetteredly, and the fact that it fits so neatly into NHGRI's mission is in part because it's not disease focused and, and, and the fact that it doesn't overlap with many of these other things that are going on that are related, this, this notion of kind of staying disease agnostic. Um, and kind of thinking, you know, if this is going to be, this is now the fourth phase, right? And I, I think it, it just strikes me that it really, it, it needs to evolve in some significant way um, beyond what it is now. And, I'm, you know, I think there are a lot of great ideas came up for directions that that might take. Um, my personal bias is is towards uh, it, rather than continue rather than the focus being on expanding the matrix beyond where it is. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be part of the activity. It it should be a, a deeper focus on understanding the matrix that we have, right? And and it's you, you know you can argue about whether that properly falls within the encode consortium or, or it should take some other form, but. We're, we're clearly at the point where we can, you know, we have these massive amounts of data on a lot of cell types. We can, you know, now in, in the coming year, we be, we'll be able to do genetic ma manipulations that were, you know, hard to, hard to imagine even a year and a half ago. Um, and, and it seems like it's a great opportunity to take advantage of this moment and to, to try and really work towards mechanistic understanding of the data that we do have. Um, that, that's at least my view, and I don't know what, is the best form for that, but I, I think that should be squarely under NHGRI's mission. Um. Thank you. Uh, any comments on that before we, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. I, I think one question, um, you know, if we do move into the disease realm, 
you know, doing one, is that useful? Or doing six, is that more useful? Doing 20, I mean, what, what, I mean, obviously you're not gonna do 20, but I mean, what's the value of doing a little bit versus, and are we gonna learn anything from that? You raised it, Joe. Yeah, uh, make Mike's a not comment. Here anymore. Yeah, not not specifically focused on um, on a disease, but on the variation that exists in the population that will have disease, right? Mm -hmm. So, looking at lots of, uh, I think it can go back to the cardiomyocytes that these individuals, um, both normal and some with 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 particular disease or variation, could provide a lot of information about what normal. Uh, uh, cardiomyocyte if gene expression looks like as well as provide candidates for disease. So I, I think if you, you know, if you pick the system right, it will, that is based on the, a lot of the biology that's out there for studying disease models, it fits hand in hand with the cell systems that uh, are the best enabled or developed because those folks have spent a lot of time developing the cell system to study particular biology usually which is coupled to some disease phenotype. So it's not studying the disease per se, but studying the, but the development of the cell type in the context of variation, some of which is disease. John? Yeah, I think with regard to disease, one of the remarkable things about the last phase of ENCODE is that although the focus was all on normal generally on normal material outside of the uh, uh, outside of the, the you know the minority of cell lines when you cross that with the genetic data you suddenly got information on disease and and so it doesn't mean that we're not working on disease and so I would say regardless of what's done in the area of disease samples because there this is a huge you know can of worms but and code certainly could do something to much more greatly enable the study of specific disease systems. For example, you take the, the heart. It would be fantastic to have, you know, the, the different types of atrial cells and, and things like that. You know, in there. In other words, we know what all the what a lot of the different cells and tissues are that become diseased, and and in many cases we don't penetrate those. And if we just sat there ad hoc and had them, you know, be generated, for example, by the community, it may not it may not happen in a coordinated fashion. So I think that actually enabling certain disease areas could be an uh, an easy goal. Oh, thank you. I would like to add a couple of things. I think one, one question, of course, is how deep is your pocket? So how many diseases can you take? Um, but to follow up a bit on, on what John is saying, essentially, when, when we start looking at uh, healthy donors and, and we look at 200, the variation is enormous and much more than, than we had expected. So if you then start from one example or two examples that you have, and extrapolate to what is overlapping with GEO SNPs and what, what not, then basically you are entering um, a very murky uh, business. And I think you have to realize if you go into it, your, uh, your normal cohort might be several hundred, um, preferably more, and your disease cohort would probably be several thousand in, in that order. And, and how deep you can go into that is, is one of the major questions and how easy your material uh, you can get. But I think you have to realize that you really need to do very large groups of people and analyze and do all your enhancer mapping and so on before you can really make strong statements about uh, where, which uh, GVO SNP is a causative SNP. Because the, the variation is, is simply very, very high. At least in the blood case, the variation is enormous and you have all the, the exposures from the environment. So there, the problem might be bigger than in other diseases, but I think the variation is enormous, in normal already. So I just want to add to that point. I think if you choose systems where the target tissue is very clear, that can also, you know, make things less complicated. I mean, obviously, cardiovascular disease is a really complicated question. But then when you start looking at um, diseases that particularly affect, for example, a ventricular cardiomyocyte, um, I, sorry, I keep going back to the heart things because that's what I know, but um, there are, are diseases that really target a specific cell type or tissue, and those probably will be better platforms if it kind of all falls into place to think about. 
Let, let, let me clarify, we're looking at very highly uh, homogeneous cell types. We're not looking at uh, blood or the whole thing. Really very well-defined cell types that you take out of blood and analyze, and then the variation is enormous. So I don't know how, how that looks like. Them, if you let them race, arrive, and we simulate, and then often we race much of that environmental variation. I did get only if half you, of them. If you let, if you let them you know, if you derive cells from the blood, on the other hand, and then re-stimulate them ex vivo, sure, things clean up substantially. Uh, I, I think things complicate extensively. But I don't know. People have done effective genetic associations in this way, for example. But I think we're also talking about um, if you're looking at variation. Sure, there's there's millions of uh, variants across the genome. But if you also take a focused approach, for example, I think there have been so many studies from many people in this room that really um, clearly shows that many um, variants associated with complex diseases or traits are actually enriched in some of these functional elements. So if we already reduce our search space, you know, obviously we're not going to find everything, but it's, it's, a, it's a way to actually start to make some traction that when we learn uh, from those studies that could be generalizable or extrapolated to, you know, the larger genome. I'm just wondering, based on this discussion, if you're going to study a bunch of different uh, cardiac cells, given this discussion, do they all have to be from one person in order to be able to be able to compare? <clears throat> But and many different kinds of cells from many different patients. That's one of the values of having some. That's one of the values of having some characterization of cell types because cell types give you where things are expressed, and if you have genes genetically associated, it does give you a clue into cell of origin, or cells of origin, often it won't be just one. And I think this would be a great, great opportunity for collaboration between ENCODE and GTEx. So GTEx has, for example, uh, left ventricle uh, samples from, uh, I think, now 500 individuals, and uh, you could do a lot of things with that. Hey, thank you. I think we're going to turn it over to Jeff, and a few of us will help wrap things up.